inkling of understanding of what the uh, rules are on inheritance in Jane Austen's time, you really would have a very difficult time understanding some of her novels. So I'm going to try to break that into it for you, break it into small bite-sized pieces. Now, I want to emphasize, however, that this is a subject that can be mind-bogglingly complex. There are rules and then oodles of exceptions to those rules. If any of you have ever been to law school, you study this in first year property, but then there's another whole course on future interest. And it's riddled with exceptions. The rule against perpetuity, uh, the fertile octogenarian rule, the rule in Shelley's case. Uh, I'm not gonna go into all of those. I'm gonna re really deal with the 30,000 foot view, which is really all you need to understand for, for Jane's writings, okay? Now, first, let me explain what the, the three pillars of Regency inheritance rules are. What the law is, what property is all about, and the idea of the family. And you've got to understand those three concepts uh, to understand what I'm going to follow it afterwards. Now, the law. Today, whether you live in the United States or Canada, when we think of the law, we think of a cascade of statutes that come out every year from Congress or Parliament or so. That was not the rule in Jane Austen's time. Parliament only set for about three to four months. It was not their main occupation. They didn't have an army of staffers. So they would come out with a few statutes every year, uh, but most of it would be case law, the common law, where judges would decide uh, something. So in this talk, there's only about two or three statutes that I'll mention. Most of it is all judge-made law. Now, this is trial and error. What the heck do I mean by that? In the year 1400, somebody might have written a will or written a contract that they thought was ironclad. But then in 1425, someone found an exception to that. But then in 1450, someone closed that loophole. So after four, five, six hundred years of doing that, the rules were pretty much ironclad if, if you had a competent lawyer, a competent solicitor, drafting the will, okay? If you made a mistake, you didn't use a phrase or you, didn't, or you added a word, it could be problematic. But most of the rules came out of common law. Now, within this subset of the law, we need to talk about women's property rights, okay? Now, first rule. Most of the rules on property came from medieval time when the monarch, the sovereign, would provide land to his subjects, his or her subjects in the case of Queen Mary or Queen uh, Elizabeth. This would go to the males who would lead armies into battle on behalf of the monarch. So women's property rights were severely limited. Now, when I first joined JASNA, you would hear people say, well, women couldn't own property. And that's not accurate, that's overbroad. Certainly, Lady Catherine had property. Mrs. Ferris certainly had property. The rule was, was there a legally dominant male in the woman's life? Okay? If you were a minor, if you were below 21, your father was the legally dominant male. Okay? If you were unmarried and over 21, you were a femme soul. You had a great deal of rights, including property rights. But if you were a minor or if you were married, you had no property rights. You were a femme covert, okay? All your property rights went to the husband. Now, take a look at that. Hopefully you can all read that. Uh, uh, this is from Blackstone's commentaries. Blackstone was a jurist, British jurist, brilliant mind. By their marriage, the husband and wife are one person in law. That is, the very being or legal existence of the, of the woman is suspended. So the two became one, and the one was the husband, okay? Now, and that lasted for a long time. One of the suffragettes, uh, Millicent Fawcett, uh, right about 1900, had her purse stolen. So they caught the, uh, the miscreant and she went to court to get her day in court. And they started reading the complaint that her purse, the, 
the, the lawful property of Henry Fawcett, her husband. And she was sort of outraged about that. What, 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 what am I, chopped liver? Uh, under the law, yes, you were chopped liver. Okay? All the property went to the husband. Now, understand what that meant. If Wickham had married uh, Georgiana Darcy, it would no longer be her 30,000 pounds. It would be his 30,000 pounds. Okay? Now, there are exceptions to that. I'll talk about that in a little while. But one other exception was, when you think about it, a rich widow, such as Mrs. Ferris, Lady Catherine, uh, Mrs. Jennings, had very little incentive to remarry. Think about that. She would walk into that marriage chapel, a rich, powerful person. She would walk out of it, a legal non-entity. All of the money would go in her husband's name. Okay, now I'll talk about the exceptions about that in a little while. But what does all this mean? If you are a father, if at all possible, leave very little property and certainly no real property to a daughter, okay? So understand that. Now, I try to bring this a little bit forward to talk about uh, women's rights during uh, the uh, Downton Abbey. And the reason for that, so many people were engrossed in Downton Abbey. The rules had changed a little bit by the time Lady Mary and Matthew are, are about. By that time, as you can see there on 1870, married women were entitled to money they earned and to inherit property. But focus on that word entitled. That doesn't mean the father had to give uh, property to them. He could if he wanted to, but he didn't have to. Okay? Then in 1882, expand a little bit. Then by 1893, uh, Married women had the same property rights as unmarried women, but that didn't mean that a father was required to leave property to women. It only meant that he could. So you've got to keep that in the back of your mind, and I'll, I'll come back to that. I'll tie all of this up uh, as we go through, okay? Now, next concept I need to talk about is property. We all talk about, well, property. Two ways of looking at property. What's the corpus? What is the type of property that we're talking about? And what rights does someone have regarding that property? Okay. Now, what is the corpus? There are two types. Real property, land, and personal property. Real property is land and all things permanently attached to the land. So, if the father has a grove of maple trees, very, very important lumber. That is real property. Those trees are permanently attached to the land. If there is an apple orchard, the trees are permanently this is attached. This Zoom, talking about inheritance. Okay. If someone could mute their mic, that would be great. <laughs> if uh, the apple trees are part of the land, the apples themselves, however, are not permanently attached to the land. They're not permanently attached to the tree. They are designed to fall off. So they would be personal property. And again, I'll explain why that is important in a little bit. Now, land was critically important first as a source of income. Now, remember, during Jane's lifetime, it was still pretty much an agricultural society. Certainly, it was in the process of changing. The Industrial Revolution uh, was starting. Uh, commercial merchants, bankers were getting more and more important. Uh, but the great landed estates, their main income was from the land, was from agriculture, was from crops, was from their herds. And also, it was a status symbol. You know, Bingley, he had to have an estate to be able to rise in society. But besides land, there was personal property. Jane Austen owned property. Not real property as far as we know, but personal property. She had clothing, she had books, she had cash, she had jewelry. All of that was personal property. 
Jane left a will. There's no reason whatsoever to have a will except to dispose of your property. So remember that property can be land or it can be personality. Now, another way of looking at property is what is your rights to property? Now, at the top of the food chain, fee simple. You own it in time. I own my house, okay? I've paid off the mortgage. I own it in fee simple. I have unqualified title to it. Now, I use the word title there. Hopefully, that's the last time I'm going to use the word title in that capacity. From now on, when I use the word title, I'm going to be referring to the Earl of Grantham, the Duke of Devonshire, okay? I'm going to talk about the title granted by uh, the monarch, okay? But fee simple, I own my house. I can sell it. I can donate it. I can knock the house down and rebuild it, okay? I can do that. But that's not the only property right. I can give or sell a life estate to one of my sons. My son, Jimmy, you will have the right to live in the house for the rest of your natural right, life, and then it will go to someone else. Uh, I can rent out my house, okay? I can rent it out for a year or for a summer. Uh, I can give an easement to someone to travel over my road. I can give an easement to someone for the mineral rights or something like that. All of those people will have property rights in that property, but only insofar as they are lawfully entitled to use it. You cannot sell, you cannot mortgage, you cannot lend more than what you have. Now, what the heck does that mean? If I rent a car from Hertz for the weekend, I cannot sell that car. I don't have the right to sell that car. I only have the property right to use it for that weekend. Conversely, if I go ahead and rent that car from Hertz for the weekend, my creditors cannot grab that car and sell it. If they do, they're going to hear from Hertz's lawyers. You cannot sell, mortgage, or loan more than the property right that you have, okay? So that's property. Third thing I wanted to talk about as that third pillar of Regency rights that you've got to understand or concept is the family. The family in Jane Austen's time meant much more than the nuclear or the immediate family, okay? My wife and I, we have three children. That is our nuclear family, our immediate family. Now, I'm sure I've got second and third cousins twice removed. I don't know them. I don't care about them. I don't wish them any harm. But if they were to be struck by lightning, it would not change my life in one way, form, or another. Okay? Different in Jane's time. There was a fiduciary duty to your ancestors and your descendants, even if you didn't know them, even if they didn't exist yet. Uh, Edmund Burke, uh, the philosopher in Jane Austen's time, viewed it as a contract with those who are already dead, those who are living, and those who are not yet born. It was a sacred trust, and that phrase appears quite a lot in the writings of your ancestors and your descendants to preserve, protect, and, po and hopefully expand uh, the property that has been left to you for them. It was a sacred trust. Trust. Remember Lord Grantham in Downton Abbey had this wonderful phrase about Downton Abbey. Downton has been my third parent and my fourth child. It is a sacred trust for me to preserve it, protect it, and pass it on to my descendants. So those are the three concepts you've got to understand as we start this. Now, what were the twin dangers to the estate that has been handed down to me from five or 600 years of my ancestors uh, accumulating this property? Division and dissipation, the two Ds that were the dangers to the estate. Now, 
I want to spend more time on this slide than I would have just a few weeks ago, because I had a question from one of my region uh, members. Uh, the answer to the first problem division is primogenitor. Leave everything to the oldest son. The answer to the second subject, uh, danger dissipation is the entail, to skip a generation, okay? Now, a fellow member of my region said, I need to know more about primogenitor or, and, uh, and uh, the entail, uh, when you would use one and not the other. It is not an either or situation. While they are separate legal concepts, they merge together perfectly well. In fact, normally they are. So it is not an either or situation. Now, the division, okay? I am a loving father. I am the beneficiary of 10,000 acres of prime real estate in Hampshire, in Kent, what have you, okay? I'm getting on in years. I want to leave that to my children. I have four children. I've got Celia. I've got Lisa. I've got Chris. I've got Jimmy. I love my children. I love them equally. So what am I going to do? I'm going to leave it to them equally. What have I just done? In one fell swoop, I've taken my family out of the aristocracy and put them in the gentry. Typically, estates of 3,000, 4,000 acres and above, you are in the aristocracy. Below that, you are in the gentry. You're still well off, but not as well off as the family was before. And you know that wonderful estate, the manor, Pemberley, Longbourn, what have you, that I've lived in, that I've given bequeathed to Lisa. That really was dependent upon the rents, the crops from all 10,000 acres. Lisa will not have that in the future. So the manor house will fall into disrepair. So for that reason, they developed the idea of, well, got to leave it just to one of my children. Now that made perfect sense, okay? Got to leave it to the eldest. Well, that made perfect sense, okay? This is the one you knew you were going to have, the longest you'd have to train to get to know what they had to do. And considering what we've already said about women's property rights, leaving it to the oldest son made perfect sense. That's what primogenitor is all about. Now, a few statutes. 1536, the statute of uses, Henry VIII, recognized, recorded primogenitor. Okay, it didn't require it, but it recognized it and it became the preference. 1540, the statute of wills. If I own property, fee simple, I don't have to give it to my oldest son. I own it. Best example in Jane Austen's writing, Mrs. Ferris, Sense and Sensibility. Edward didn't do what she wanted. Boom, quickly gave it uh, to uh, Robert Ferris perfectly permissible for her to do. If she owned it in fee simple, she could give it to anybody she wanted. Now, if she died without a will, the law would presume that she wanted to preserve the estate and give it uh, to the uh, eldest son. But that could be overcome if there was a will. Now, many of you don't like uh, primogenitor. You think it is unfair. I fully agree with you. But it made perfect sense to someone in Jane's time. And it allowed the British aristocracy to retain their power hundreds of years after the French aristocracy, the Russian aristocracy, had lost there. The French aristocracy, the Russian aristocracy, did not believe in primogenitor. They split the estate so that by Jane Austen's time, and certainly for 100 and 150 years afterwards, you had a lot of French and Russian nobles with great titles, no money. It had been dissipated. It had been divided over the years. Now, one other statute I have to mention to you, it's a great statute. 
Britain really didn't care for the Irish, especially the Irish aristocracy. So what did the British Parliament have the Irish Parliament do in 1703, the Popery Act? Primogenitor was outlawed in Ireland for Catholics. You could still have primogenitor in Ireland for the Protestants, but the Irish aristocracy could not, was prohibited uh, from leaving their estate to the firstborn son. They had to split it equally among their heirs unless the firstborn son agreed to uh, reject Catholicism. The result, the power of the Irish aristocracy was crushed, okay? So with all of that, what were the unfortunate impacts of primogenitor? Everything going to the firstborn son. On the wife, boy, you better hope you were on good terms with your firstborn son because your livelihood thereafter is to a great extent dependent upon how well he likes you, okay? So that was a problem. And I'll talk about Dower and others in a few minutes. On the eldest son, from his earliest days, he knew all of this is coming to me, people. So you all had better be nice to me. And what need have I of really applying myself to my studies? I'm set. I don't have to worry about that. Think of Thomas Bertram, okay, in Mansfield's Park. On the youngest brothers, people, younger sons, You've, ra you've been raised in a nice lifestyle, but boy, this is all going to end. Okay, remember, you know, uh, Colonel Fitzwilliam, he had some very pithy things to say about uh, what he could do with his life, what he could, who he, he could hope to marry. He had better marry well, or he better find a good occupation. Let me point out something to you. I'm, I'm reading a book now. I don't know if you can see it. It's Gentlemen of Uncertain uh, Fortune. It came out within the last year or two. It's by Rory Muir, M-U-I-R. It is specifically about younger sons. They were not going to inherit the estate unless they had the good fortune, and it's strange to phrase it that way, of their older brothers dying before them. Otherwise, you need to find a trade, the military holy orders, uh, to a lesser extent, medicine or so. But you've got to find a, a, a trade because you will not be getting much, if anything, of your father's estate uh, on daughters. Think about that. You could be the eldest child. You could be unqualifiedly the, the brightest child. But you aren't going to inherit, you certainly were not going to inherit real property if there was a, a, a if you had a brother. And you probably were not going to inherit much. You, you know, if your father was, was well enough off, they would may put something aside for you. And again, I'll, I'll talk about that more in a moment. What is the impact of all of this? Family dynamics were really kind of dysfunctional in many, in many ways. Uh, the good side, it was the plot of many British murder mysteries for well over a century. Who stands to inherit by the eldest brother's uh, death or something like that? But that's division. That's primogenitor. Okay. Now, what did that mean if the woman had money? Okay. And I need to go over some concepts here. Now, I've tried to break this down for you. What were the woman's common law rights, the wife's common law rights? First, she had a wife, a right to necessaries. The husband could not kick uh, her out without a penny. He had to at least give her clothing and food to live on, okay? Now, this was a theoretical right. It was rarely implemented for two reasons. First off, this would bring a lot of embarrassment to the husband. So he normally would at least provide for his wife's food and, and, and clothing. Theoretically, if he didn't do that, the wife would, could go to a merchant and buy it, charge my husband. Now, that was a right in theory. Most merchants didn't want to get into that hassle. But that was on the books. Now, dower. Dower was a common law right. 
Basically, it gave, it, it was, think of it as a widow's annuity. If she became a widow, she was entitled to uh, one third of the land that her husband had owned and occupied during the marriage. Okay? So she would have a right to live on the land, you know, the widow's cottage, the dowry cottage or so. Uh, she would also have a right to one third of the rents and profits that would come from that. Now, that was on its way out. In fact, it went out uh, by statute in 1833. So it existed in Jane Austen's time, but it was on its way out. And I'll explain why in a moment, okay? But those were the common law rights. Now there was a device not dependent on marriage. That was the trust. Now the equity courts, the chancery had recognized this. Uh, Jane's cousin, Eliza, soon to be her sister-in-law, had income from a trust that her godfather, Warren Hastings, had set up for her. This was a vehicle where someone, her father, her godfather, someone, would create a contract. It was not dependent on marriage, necessarily, or at all, with a banker, for example put some money aside for, you know, for her, and that banker, that trustee would dole that out periodically in accordance uh, with that. It would be held, it would be safeguarded from the husband. So, quote, the husband could not kiss or kick it out of her, okay? He could not while it away from her by playing on her affections or her abuse her to give up her trust rights. So kiss and kick was actually a term of art during, during Jane's lifetime. And then there were devices incident to marriage. These are not common law rights, these are contractual rights. Now the settlement, so, uh, an amount was settled upon her and her children. These were the marriage articles. Now remember when Mr. Darcy was having that long meeting with Mr. Bennett. They were not talking about, well, who will pay for the rehearsal dinner or something like that. It was much more substantial. What is the portion, the amount that Elizabeth, that the bride is bringing into the marriage, okay? I'm gonna come back to that in a moment. What is the pin money that she is to get? Now, this is different from necessaries. Necessaries was the bare minimum, the pin money. This is the money that the husband will provide to the wife for pins, for dresses, for trips to the millinery shop, hats, things like that, okay? What pin money you will have, this was to be set forth by contract in the marriage articles. And then you come to jointure. Jointure, remember Mrs. Jennings had an ample jointure. Mrs. Russell. Uh, Lady Russell had a jointure. Jointure was the modern day replacement for dower. Now, why was dower that common law right on its way out? When you think about it, who would possibly want to pay, want to buy, or certainly pay full money for property to which a, a woman had dower rights? Okay? Think about that. You would pay good money, full price, for a piece of property, a farm, a house, what have you. All at once, there's a knock on the door. You open the door, and there is a recently widowed woman. Hi, I'm your new roommate. My husband owned and occupied this land during our marriage. He just died, so I'm moving in. And I'm go I have a right now to one third of the rents and the profits. Because of that, it was very difficult to sell land or at least for full price. So that was a restraint on the owner's ability to sell the property. So slowly but surely, it was replaced by jointure. 
And by jointure, the woman was able to waive her dower rights. And in return, she got essentially an annuity. The way the jointure worked was this. If a woman brought in a portion of 10,000 pounds, 30,000 pounds, 50,000 pounds, typically she would get a jointure, again, typically of 10% of that. Could be more, could be less, but 10% was typically it. So if Georgiana Darcy brought in her 30,000 pounds to the marriage, she would have a jointure of 3,000 pounds, 10% per year, okay? So once the husband died, that is what she would uh, live on and along with any other trust that she might have. So that is what uh, Mrs. Jennings lived on. That is what Lady Russell lived on. It enabled the couple, not just the husband, to be able to sell the property at full price during uh, during uh, their their marriage, okay? So by 1833, the dower was pretty much done away with because it would, turned out to be an unreasonable restraint on the, the transfer of land, okay? Now, women in marriage, if the women woman had no money. Uh, we've all read uh, Pride and Prejudice. We've all watched probably all the movie and film versions of Pride and Prejudice. And Mrs. Bennett probably drives all of us crazy. What a silly woman. What a, what a, what, what a hysterical woman. She's going all about how Elizabeth has to marry that odious uh, Mr. Collins, what have you. What a pathetic woman. I don't think Jane's contemporaries thought Mrs. Bennett was that hysterical, not that comical, not that silly. Mrs. Bennett was frightened, and she was justifiably frightened. There was no Social Security. There was no Medicare. If you did not have money and you didn't marry well, you were in a world of hurt, okay? You'd have to work. And when I say that to young people, they say, oh, well, who cares? They become an intern, they work their way up the bank, what have you. No, you don't understand. Those employment opportunities were not open uh, to women, okay? Maybe you'd be a governess, and that was not a great thing. Or you were gonna live in, 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 in poverty, okay? So remember all those things in Pride and Prejudice that Mr. Collins, not as bluntly, but Mrs. Pennant, Mrs. Bennett says to Elizabeth very bluntly, Collins is a jerk. We know that. He's going to look a lot better when you're destitute. Okay. So there was a lot of lo logic uh, to Sharon Lucas's viewpoint. Remember in uh, Leslie Castle, Louisa Burton, beautiful lady in the outside. Her father said, you've got to be nice to people while they're courting so you can get married and get married well, okay? Afterwards, who cares? You're married, okay? So that was the plight of women in Jane Austen's time. That why is such a, such a central theme of her, of her uh, uh, her novels, okay? Now, the second threat, dissertation, okay? So I've got, I've got three sons. My oldest son is Jimmy. He's my eldest son. Say he's my only child. He's my only son. He's my only child. I've got to give it to him. But let's face it. He's got the brains of a cheeseburger. Or he has a drinking problem. Or he has a gambling problem. Or he has a laudanum problem. Oh my gosh, what am I going to do? I go around the estate looking at the portraits of my ancestors. Oh, Grandfather Schmidlap, what am I going to do? I'm going to leave this to Jimmy. It's got to go to him. It'll be gone. You know, 
the work of 12 generations will be gone in one lifetime because of my son's inability uh, to take, take care of money. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. What's this thing from France? The entail, the untail, to carve out. That's the answer. Rather than give everything to him in fee simple, I'll use the fee tail. I will give it to him, to Jimmy and the heirs of his body, or more likely, the male heirs of his body. And it will be a male entail. Didn't have to be. To be a female entail, but the vast majority of them were male entail. Okay, in that case, he basically has a life estate, and it will then go in fee simple to his son, to his oldest child. What a great idea! Jimmy then can be as profligate as he wants, and his creditors can come to him. They can take his jewelry. They can take the shirt off his back but they can't take the land. They can't take the house. He doesn't own the land. Remember what I said earlier? You can only sell, mortgage, lend the property to the extent you have a property right in it. So if he only has a, a, a land, a, a, a life estate, that's the only interest that's a problem. Okay, they cannot take the land. Now. Hopefully, it insulates the property from that first generation's mistake. So that's why in Sense and Sensibility, when uh, Henry Dashwood's uncle leaves it in entail, we look at that as so cruel. To Jane's contemporaries, that made perfect sense. It kept it in the family for another extra generation. Okay? Now, the problem with that, tremendous parent child rivalry remember what i talked about earlier okay i'm i'm uh, i have the fee tail okay i have a life estate in my property uh my son jimmy he's going to inherit it eventually say take that example uh son i want to paint the house green fine okay i've got no voice in the matter jimmy says uh i'm going to make the driveway circular fine knock yourself out uh, I'm going to sell uh, that uh, maple tree orchard. Oh, contraire. Those trees are part of the land. They are permanently affixed to the land. I do not consent to that. Okay? He can put a stop to that. Okay? Now, if it's an apple orchard, I want to sell the apples. He can, there's nothing he can do about that. They are not attached to the land. Okay? So that's the, uh, that's the, that's the fee entail. Very, very common. I give it to Jimmy and the heirs of his body. Okay. If I just said heir to his heirs, I would be giving it uh, in fee simple. If I say it to the heirs of his body, it's an entail, either male or female. The vast majority to the male heirs of his body. Okay. I'll come back to that. Okay. Now, Remember I said earlier, there's a difference between the title, the Earl of Grantham, and the property. Okay? Now look at the right side of that. Could the property owner disinherit his oldest son under the title? Almost always no. Okay? The title was going to go to the eldest son. Now there were some rare exceptions. If, for example, the eldest son was like Jane's eldest brother George, clearly mentally incompetent. Okay. They could there were ways around that. It required a high level approval. But absent that exception, the title would go to the eldest son unless if, unless the title could go down to females. Now that's extremely rare. It's more common, but still rare but more common in England, in Scotland. Scotland, oddly enough, was much more protective of women's rights than, than England uh, was. The one other exception is in England, Lord Nelson, Admiral Nelson, when he died at the Battle of Trafalgar, Parliament was so upset, anxious to preserve his name that they made his brother a Viscount. Uh, 
and they said it would go down the male line. However, if there being no surviving heirs male, it could go over to the female line because they wanted to preserve Admiral Nelson's uh, heritage. But absent something like that, the, <laughs> the property owner could not disinherit the oldest son from the title. Now, on the left side of that slide, what about the property? Could the owner, property owner disinherit the son? Uh, basically, yes, but there were some exceptions to that. Uh, when the title was given, you are the Earl of Grantham and you're so on and so forth for your eldest sons. Typically, the monarch would give letters patent with that, granting the estate. So the estate, the original estate, would still go to the title owner. But if there had been any other property accumulated during the generations, there was no requirement that they go, okay? Now, the vast, vast, vast majority of time, the property would go to the one who held the title, okay? Now, there are exceptions. Now, Charles Spencer, Lady Diana's brother, the Earl of Spencer. In 2010, he wrote a great article in Vanity Fair about estates, primogenitor, fetal, things like that. So if you get a chance, read it. It's a wonderful article. He tells the, st the, the story of one lord, a Scottish lord. The eldest son was a bit of a problem. Went to jail for three years. He robbed a liquor store in the village, okay? When he got out of jail, uh, he developed an online pornography saw, you know, business, okay? The father was berserk with anger. Okay, okay, there's nothing I can do to disinherit you from the title. You are going to inherit the baronetcy, the barony but I'm not gonna give you the property. The house is going to your younger brother who is not the wastrel, the criminal that you are, okay? But absent an exception like that, the title would go to the eldest son and the property would all likelihood go to the eldest son. Now, if you're unclear on that, I'm gonna come back to that in a couple of slides and make it very clear for you, okay? Now, I don't want to leave this subject without talking about adoption. Adoption, as we know it, did not exist in Jane Austen's time, okay? If I were to adopt Cecilia, okay, she is now my lawful child. A month from now, she gives me some lip and I want to disinherit her. If she is a minor, I can't do that. She is my child, okay? That did not exist in Jane Austen's time. You could treat someone like your own. You could bequeath your property to them. But if you entered into that relationship with Edward, uh, Jane's brother, and then a month later, he did something you didn't like, you could cut him off without a penny. Not a problem, okay? Uh, perfectly permissible. Now, why was this? Why did this happen? Remember I talked about the family, okay? You've got to understand how important the family was. If you were a childless couple, you didn't want the line, the family name to die out. So you would pick someone, typically a relative, maybe a distant relative, maybe an orphan that you thought had potential, and you would enter into essentially a contractual relationship with them. And the names and arms clause, they would agree to adopt your name, to adopt the family name of Lee. Now, originally it might be Edward Austin Lee, but eventually the Austin would be dropped out as it was normally done very quickly, unless the name Austin had some uh, cachet, as certainly Jane Austen's name you know, does, but normally the name of uh, the adoptive parents would come into play, would be prominent, would be the sole name very quickly. 
and they would adopt the coat of arms for the family. So the family name would continue even if the child was in fact biologically uh, childless. Now bastards were a different category. Uh, oops. Once a bastard, always a bastard. Okay. If you were not, if your parents were not married when you were born, you were a bastard and a bastard you shall remain. Okay. Now they could acknowledge you, they could adopt you. If they own the property in fee simple, they could give money, give the land to you, but you could not in inherit the title, okay? The title did not go down. The Earl of Grantham would not have gone uh, to a bastard, okay? But if you were acknowledged, you know, if the father had a conscience and say, this is my child, and they owned it in fee simple, I can live my, leave my property to you. If, if it was entailed, almost certainly they could not do that. Okay, they would not go to a bastard. Okay? Now, what, those, what that second bullet deals with is if the father acknowledged the son as his own. If the father did not acknowledge that, the child was nullius filius, the son of no one. Now, if that sounds terribly cruel to you, remember that in Jane Austen's time, there was no blood test. There was no DNA analysis. This was a breeding ground for fraud. Very often these claims of parentage would occur after the reputed, reputed father had died. So the main witness for the defense was no longer there. So you had unscrupulous people saying, well, this child, boy, doesn't he look like the late Earl? Uh, this is his son. So the law made a value judgment. No, unless this child was acknowledged, it's nullius filius, son of no one, does not inherit, okay? A, a harsh rule, but the rule. Okay? Now, Ending the entail, okay? You have an entail. There were mechanisms to end it. The first is still around, by the way, even today. It was designed to protect against the dead hand of the grave, protecting, you know, guiding things for too long. Originally an entail, I leave it uh, under, under these rules for perpetuity, for all times. And fairly early on, the English jurists said, no, there's got to be a limit on that, okay? So they came against up with the rule against perpetuities. It basically is only good for lives and beings plus 21 years, okay? So after 60, 80, or 100 years, even including the 21 years added on to a normal lifespan, it's gone, okay, the rules don't apply anymore. Cutting off the entail. Now, this was very common. Say, I am Mr. Bennett. Okay. I have I have a life estate, for example. Uh, I have a son. Say I'm Sir Thomas Bertram. Okay. I have a life estate. I go to go to my son uh, Thomas. Uh, we're going to cut off the entail. We're going to dock the entail. You will give up. Uh, your rights under the entail, uh, I will then give you a life estate and the uh, entail will go to your son, whichever one you have. And we will extend it another generation. Okay? Now the younger son goes, no, I don't want to do that. Okay? Uh, right now everything's going to come to me. I'm not going to do that. So then the father would go this, okay, now I don't know when I'm going to die, but I'm in good health. I may not I die for another 20 or 30 years. Listen to me. Son, you will not get a farthing for the rest of my life. The use of the carriage, forget about it. The, loose, the use of the London townhouse, forget about it. You're going to have to live on your own on your own wits, your own training, 
until I die. And let's be clear about this. You're not qualified to do anything. So unless you agree to cut off the entail now, you better go find a job. And at that point, young Thomas would go, oh, I see the merits of your position. So they would agree to dock the entail, okay? So that was the second way of doing it. Third way, common recovery, I'm gonna mention it. It died within a generation of, of Jane's death. It was basically a fraud upon the court that the very often the court knew about, but they would uh, accept it because it was in everyone's best interest. Say, for example, a once in a lifetime opportunity shows up for Mr. Bennett or Sir Thomas to sell this property, sell that grove of maple trees or what have you. But because of the entail, they have no right to do that, okay? Even if there wasn't a son yet, uh, they would have no right to do that because one, a son was possible. So what they would do is they would theoretically sell it to someone else who would then sell it to a third party who would then sue. And then all at once, one of those parties would disappear. It was a fraud on the court, but it was designed to basically uh, allow the parties, the family, to take advantage of a once in a lifetime uh, opportunity. It was done away with within a generations of Jane's death. I'm not gonna talk about it anymore. <clears throat> Smashing the entail. I put it in quotes. I put it in quotes because if you remember Downton Abbey, Maggie Smith, uh, uh, the, the, the dowager countess, this is what she said when, before they give the estate to Matthew. Well, we'll look at smashing the entail. We'll find a loophole and we will cut out Cora's money. If you had Cora, remember the Earl's wife. Now, this was not a concept in Jane's time. It was a device that you know, uh, Maggie Smith was coming up to. We'll carve out the money from the estate. Didn't happen. Why? Two reasons. First, remember what I started out with. The rules by this time were pretty clear. And as long as you had a competent lawyer and uh, the Earl's father had hired Murray, the solicitor, and he was pretty competent. He did everything right. And as Murray said, your father tied it up, you know, very neatly in a pack of ribbons. So it wasn't possible legally. But also, I think that would be unpalatable to the Earl of Grantham. If it were successful, understand what would happen. The money would go to Cora and the children, Mary, Edith, Sybil. Matthew would still inherit the title and Downton Abbey, but he would not have the money to keep it up. The result, it would fall into disrepair. The family name would be embarrassed. That would be unthinkable to someone like the Earl, okay? So smashing the entail made a wonderful uh, device uh, uh, by the screenwriter of Downton Abbey. It simply was not likely at all for legal and family reasons in Jane Austen's time, okay? Now, I think that is my, that is my last slide. Hopefully that was clear. Uh, why don't I stop that? And then I'll, uh, hopefully you all understood that, but let me ask, are there any questions? So yes, there's, there's some questions. Um, so, well, first of all, um, let's um, thanks James for that great talk. So do our little silent uh, clap. <laughs> and um, there's some questions uh, that were sent to me. And um, so I'm going to take a look at them and I will read them out so okay. that we can get some answers. 
Um, okay, so here's um, a question. Uh, what, uh, what would happen if the current owner of an entailed property died while his wife was pregnant? As the uh. sex of the child couldn't be known until birth, it seems to me the status of the property would be unknown until the child is born. Yes, that actually was a problem quite a lot because uh, English common law typically wouldn't allow gaps, okay? But there were exceptions. Uh, remember that rule I talked about, I just mentioned it, the fertile octogenarian rule? Same the inheritor was 85 years old, but didn't have any children, didn't have any heirs, yet, heirs of his body. That was the fertile octogenarian rule. He could be, he could produce a child at this point. So typically, uh, if there was a child in utero, even if uh, in that clear example, uh, uh, it would be held in abeyance until the, uh, uh, the, uh, the gender the, uh, of, the part, uh, of, the, of the child was recognized. But that's a good, very good question. That would come up and it had been dealt with uh, by, uh, by the courts. It's, it was one of those uh, peculiarities. Remember, uh, without antibiotics, people could die very, very uh, suddenly in, in Jane Austen's uh, time. So very, very common. So typically what would happen, uh, it was a contingent, I don't want to get too technical about this, but it was a contingent interest as opposed to a vested interest. And it was contingent until the child was born, until you realized, okay, it's a son, great, it's a girl, okay. Then the entail would kick in. You've got to think of a male entail, someone described it this way, as, you know, today we have heat-seeking missiles, boom, it goes off and, you know, got to find a, a jet stream, the male in tail, boom, got to find a male, okay? What's the closest male heir? Uh, so if it turned out that was not a male in the womb, the contingent interest was not satisfied, uh, so then they would look to uh, the closest male heir. So hopefully that answered that question. Yes, thank you. Um, so here's the next one. Um, in Sense and Sensibility, um, does Mrs. Dashwood, so this is Eleanor and Marianne's uh, mother, does she get a third of the, because she's the dowager, does she, and does she have dower rights? Does she get a third of the income of the estate? Probably not, because uh, her husband did not own uh, uh, the, the, the property. Let me, it, it, uh, it's funny, the last time I gave this talk to an AGM, I thought I was crystal clear. And I had some people come up to me afterwards. Well, I still don't understand why Mr. Benton didn't just leave Longbourn to his daughters for their life estate. So I think the next time, if I ever give this talk again at an AGM, I'm going to use this example. Sunday morning, when you're checking out of the hotel, when you're at the front desk, go to the desk clerk. Oh, by the way, I directed my daughters be allowed to live in my room for the rest of their natural lives. See how far that gets you. It's not going to get you very far. You don't own the room. Mr. Bennett did not own Longbourn. You were merely temporary occupants of, the, uh, of that. So because uh, Mrs. Dashwood's husband did not own the property, the dower rights would not have established uh, you know, uh, for that. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see. So um, another question was, um, so jointure is not really what the husband left to his widow. It's the trust paying back an annuity to the wife using the initial um, portion that the woman brought to the marriage. Is that correct? Basically, yes. It was, it, was a, it was a contractual right as opposed to a, a, a will right. It wasn't a common law right. Uh, again, it was designed to replace dower, and it did uh, 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 eventually. Uh, 
Now, there were problems with jointure. Uh, uh, dower rights, in, in, in a lot of ways, were better for the widow. Uh, because if the, the, the jointure rights would solely depend on how much, what her portion was, how, broad she, how much she brought into. Dower rights were not dependent on that. So if, uh, if Elizabeth Bennett would probably do a lot, would do a lot better under dower rights going into Darcy's estate than she would under jointure because Mr. Bennett hadn't saved a whole lot, so there wouldn't be a whole lot of money that she would be her portion. But uh, it was going out. I don't know if I answered that question. I hope I did. Thank you. So back to, we've had another kind of um, additional part of the first question I ans asked you um, about the um, husband dying while the wife is pregnant. Um, so who is, who's running things while they're waiting the nine months um, for the baby to pop out? Like who, who's in charge? Oh, I don't know the answer to that. That's a very good question. During that time where the, when the interest is just contingent, who runs things? Right. I, I do not I do not know I would I would suspect uh, that it would have to be the wife but the wife would not be able to do much she would not be able she would have no legal right to sell anything but I if so if push came to shove on that I I, I think it would have to go to court I do not know that answer so if there's evil cousins evil male cousins in the nine months that we're waiting, they, there could be some mischief, right? There could be some mischief, but it would have to go to court and the likelihood of the courts deciding anything within nine months would not be very great. So I think basically the, uh, the court might appoint a trustee in the meantime to manage things for that, for that period of time. Now, if the child is born and is, uh, and is female, then those cousins there, their status may elevate substantially. They might be uh, the uh, 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 the new the new heirs to the property. Okay, cool so question. Suppose, so suppose suppose the baby is a boy then, but uh, until he becomes twenty one, does does he have trustees or is it the mother that's running the estate? Typically, would be typically they would have to be a trustee appointed because the mother uh, even would not, now now the mother could be the trustee. Unlikely, but it, but it's, uh, but it's possible. But there would, there would have to be someone named to act on the child's, child's behalf. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me mention. I remember I said the age of majority was was twenty one in Jane's time. Oddly enough, the age of marriage, however, for females it was twelve, uh, for for males it was fourteen. But you would need uh, the father's consent to marry below the age of 21. That's why Greta Green was so, uh, uh, so popular. You didn't need it up there. And, and would the trustees for the child be um, established in the father's will, um, the potential child, the potential male child? <laughs> That that would be the preferred that would be the preferred way of doing it. A lot of times, the, the father would not have foreseen that that eventuality. Uh, so in that case, they'd have to petition uh, the, probably the Chancery Court, the Equity Court, to appoint someone. Okay, thank you. All right. So here's another question about sense and sensibility. So in Sense and Sensibility, John Dashwood, um, he's the one, you know, that, in, that inherits, um, but he's holding the estate for Harry, his son, but he cuts down some trees on the estate. Um, and, and, and it says in the, you know, the novel that he's cutting down some trees. So um, doesn't he have to have Harry's permission to cut down those trees? <laughs> Typically, typically, yes, unless, unless the trees were diseased and they were going to be, be dying anyway. Typically, yeah, and this was, all, okay, uh, I, I see Marie shaking her head about that. We'll come back to Marie in a moment. The one problem with uh, doing that is uh, it is 
quite likely that John would have been appointed the, tr the trustee. Uh, not, not guaranteed because very often the court might decide, no, I think uh, that puts too much power into the, uh, the life estate holder. So they would go uh, to someone else. But, but technically while the child was an infant uh, under the law, uh, to, cut down, to cut down trees, uh, they would typically need the uh, the permission uh, of the entail holder. Now, I, now it looked like Marie was uh, was shaking her head, and disagreeing with that. Marie, you can unmute yourself if you wish to disagree with the. Uh, no, I, I I was shaking my head because the, the trees were not diseased, as far as I remember the passage in the novel. There's okay, just, yeah. There's trees that John and Fanny want out of there. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I use the disease things just as an example of a situation where I don't think the court would interfere. interfere. But other than that, it, I, don't think, I don't think they would have had authority to do that because it's not theirs to cut down. They are changing uh, uh, the, real, the real property because the trees are permanently attached to the, uh, to the land. Now, certainly if uh, uh, Harry were an adult, he could say, no, au contraire, and if necessary, could go to court uh, to do that. So if they did it, technically, I think they would be violating the law. You know, it might be that no one's going to bring an action or bring it to the court's attention. So that's why it might have happened. Okay, so John and Fanny are out of bounds legally as well as aesthetically. I, I, I think so. It may not have been aesthetically. They may have been doing, doing it to improve the prospect or so, but legally, I think they are out of bounds, Mary which Ann, should not surprise us about, about John and Fanny. Okay. No, thank, thank you. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Okay, so we have another question um, about the necessaries versus pin money. So the, the, the husband has to provide basic um, clothing and uh, food and such under the necessaries, um, but uh, but then pin, pin money um, was used for um, other things. So how do we how do we tell the difference between what I might require a silk ball gown? That's my necessity. I got to have a silk ball gown. So <laughs> uh, to digress for a moment, divorces were extraordinarily rare in Jane Austen's lifetime. If there was a divorce, however, the husband was only required to give the wife one dress, okay? Uh, so the idea of necessaries, boy, it's pretty bare bones compared to what, uh, what we have now. By the way, physical abuse was not a basis for divorce. Uh, as long as you didn't, permanently uh, uh, disable the wife. That was not a grounds for divorce. So when you think of necessaries, boy, you got to think of the bare, bare minimum in those days. The pin money uh, would be much, you know, that would be for the silk gowns. That would be for the numerous bonnets and stuff like that. It's difficult to quantify it. Uh, the pin money, the pin, the husband was as it was as well, maybe not as interested in the pin money as the wife was, because it would be an embarrassment to the husband <clears throat> if uh, the wife was in society looking shabby. So the pin money uh, was not something that there was going to be a big, big argument about. The husband would certainly want the wife to look. Uh, decked out in a status befitting uh, the husband. So the difference between necessaries and pin money was substantial. I hope that answered that, that question. Yes, thank you. Um, so we had an, a question about um, Emma this time, which we haven't uh, talked about oh, yet. Oh, okay. So, um, so Emma is gonna inherit uh, the estate and um, does that mean that there was no entail? I mean, how doesn't he? Isn't there a cousin somewhere? Well, it uh, in my reading of Emma, it's not absolutely crystal clear 
that Emma is going to establish inheriting state, but there's not a hint of worry in there about that. So I suspect that she is going to inherit the estate. And for that reason, remember some of the things uh, uh, Emma says, she has a lot less incentive to marry than other women her age. She's, she's pretty secure, which leads me to believe that, yeah, she's probably going to inherit. So it seems like Mr. Woodhouse owns it in fee simple. He doesn't have to worry about an entail. It is going to go to uh, 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 Emma uh, and, her, and her sister, okay? okay? Okay. I think the sister. So, and then, so does that also apply to Lady Catherine de Bourgh because her estate is not uh, entailed either? No, well, no, and Lady Catherine's is entailed but along the female line, not the male line. So technically Lady Catherine doesn't own Rosings. You know, uh, Anne is gonna be the big winner in that lottery of, uh, uh, of life, okay? So Remember the, she, I'm sorry, go ahead, Lee. Technically Lena. tell Lady Catherine what to do then. Technically, theoretically, yeah. But it sure it seems like poor Anne has been beaten down so much that she's not not going to. Uh, but technically, technically, yes, Anne could say no. Don't cut down that grove of trees. Don't don't uh, don't knock down that wing. Uh, so theoretically, you know, they could do that. Remember, remember the difference between <clears throat> if I leave uh, to uh, uh, to Jimmy. And then to and to the and to his heirs, I'm leaving it in fee simple. If I leave it to Jimmy and the heirs of his body, I'm leaving it an entail, either male or female. If I leave it to the male heirs, heirs of his body, it's a male entail, and that's where it merges so well with primogenitor. If, as in the de Burg family, it apparently goes and to the female heirs of his body. There was no law against that. It was not common, but but it could be done. Okay, thank you. All right, here's a question about persuasion. I'm trying to visit, I'm trying to have us visit all the novels with these questions. Okay. So, and they're, com they're coming into me, I'm, I'm reading them. So in persuasion, um, why don't, why doesn't, um, Sir Walter just um, pay his debts by um, by selling the the estate. I I I don't I don't think he can. I don't think he owns it in fee simple. Uh, first off, even if he did, selling part of the estate was breaking that sacred trust. Okay, you're breaking your word to your ancestors, so you didn't want to do that. But secondly, as, as I recall persuasion, he did, not, he did not own it in fee simple. And it was for that, uh, if, I'm, if my recollection is right and he would just had a life estate in it and it went to the, the next male heir, he is a perfect example of the need for an entail. This was a profligate next generation. You know, his creditors could take the shirt off his back, but they couldn't touch the estate. Okay, that's that's my recollection. I don't think Sir Walter owned it in fee simple. Okay, thank you. If if anyone has a different recollection, please let me know. Uh, okay, so here's. Um... Okay, well, that one we asked already. Uh, let's see. So, well, there, Emma's, go ahead. There, 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 there was one question that I noticed down there uh, in in uh, uh, in Downton Abbey. Okay. Uh, if they had smashed the entail and uh, Cora's money had gone away, could Matthew uh, then uh, marry a rich heiress and? cure the problem. Basically, yes. And that's, remember what uh, Robert, the Earl of Grantham had done. He had married Cora, the rich American heiress. 
very common. One out of 10 marriages of the British aristocracy around that time period was to an American. So that was a very common way of doing it. Remember Winston Churchill's mother, Jenny, that was why his father had done that. So very, very common. Okay. I'm sorry, Lisa, I interrupted you. Uh, no, it's no problem. That's no problem. Okay. That, no, that's, that's, that's very helpful. Um, so back to um, persuasion, there's another um, kind of add-on to our discussion about Sir Walter. Um, so we get the impression that he's, high, he's highly leveraged. So if he, if he did not own the estate, then how, was he able to borrow against it? Or did he just have debts that he just owed? He, he didn't borrow against it. He could borrow against whatever he had. So, for example, his right to the next crop of apples. I'll use that example again. He could borrow against uh, against that. <laughs> I, should, I, I, don't, I don't want to get into too much detail. But if he did that, okay, uh, uh, my next next year's crop of, uh, of apples is probably going to be worth, I'll pick a number, 10,000 pounds, uh, I will sell it to you for 8,000 pounds. So creditors might very well do that, but they're taking a risk. If he dies before that next crop of apples, he had no right to sell that. That was a contingent interest, okay? So when, so when he's in Bath, okay, if he's looking at all those people thinking how much more handsome he is than them, if he has that sudden heart, that heart attack, by the time he hits the ground, he has no further interest in any of those, okay? Okay, Not the, no, nothing, okay? Uh, so to go back to your basic question, he could only mortgage, uh, lend against what he had. Uh, and all he had essentially is a life estate. Uh, so anybody who lent credit to him, they were at least gambling that uh, he would live for another year or two years or something uh, like that. If they were foolish enough to lend him money against the, uh, the house, that was a very foolish venture on their part. Okay. Did that answer your question? Yes, that answered the question. Thank you. So, um... We're, we're back to Emma for just a minute. Um, so technically, um, both Emma and her sister, Isabella, who's the eldest, um, could inherit uh, Hartfield. Yeah, yeah, yes. Uh, this gets very, very technical, but that there are actually graphs out there that if I own it and I'm giving it uh, to my eldest son, if he dies, then it goes to the next eldest son, blah, blah, blah. At some point, if there are no male heirs, then it is divided uh, among the, uh, the daughters uh, equally. Uh, assuming there is no will that specifies no, Emma gets, gets this or 80% of that or something like that. Right. It, it gets surprisingly uh, complicated. And here there's a difference between the British line and the, uh, and the uh, Scottish line as to whether uh, the eldest son of a daughter inherits as opposed uh, to uh, the youngest son of an earlier son or something like that. It gets, that's when, remember I, the first thing I said this morning, or did, did, did this talk, this can get mind-bogglingly uh, complex. And I tried to avoid those issues for two reasons. First of all, your heads would be swimming. And secondly, I wouldn't be qualified to go into some of those bizarre permutations. Okay. Then, then one more slight permutation about, about Emma. Um, so John, John Knightley and Isabella have a bunch of kids. And um, as soon as um, Emma and George Knightley produce an heir, they're no longer going to inherit anything from Donwell. So their only chance of money is half of Hartfield. Uh, 
Okay, I, 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 if I remember the novel, I think that's, I think that's correct. Uh, because remember, Knightley, it, Mr. Knightley, he's the eldest, so he's going to yeah. inherit Donwell. And either Emma or Emma and Isabella are going to inherit Hartfield. Mm -hmm. But uh, Isabella has a lot of children. So they're not going to get any of Donwell. So their only thing they could get is part of her, uh, her inheritance from Hartfield. No. Remember, that presupposes that Mr. Woodhouse, it's in an entail already. If Mr. Woodhouse owns everything in fee simple, yep. there are no strings attached. It all depends on how he wants to divide it up. If he leaves without a will, then it will be divided equally, okay? Or he could say, I don't like Emma. She, she, the gruel she served me this morning was terrible. I'm going to cut her out, okay? Uh, but that's unlikely. It's entirely possible he might go, Emma will need this money more than Isabella will, so I will give the lion's share of the estate. Uh, I, I, I will give the, the, the real property to her. Again, assuming there's no entail in place, that's Mr. Woodhouse's call. And it's entirely possible he might say, Isabella and her children, they're all well, already well taken care of. Okay. All right. So I think that's, that's um, gonna, we're going to wrap it up here. Um, we could go on with these um, little permutations of uh, who inherits what forever. Um, but um, it's been a lot of fun. And it's great to um, investigate. Uh, oh, you've got some law. law no, I, wanna, I just want to point the thickness of this item out. This is chock full of law review articles, persuasion articles on what we just talked about. When I say it's a mind boggling complex issue, it really is. Jane, I think, kept it as simple as it could for the novelistic technique of not blowing her uh, readers out of, uh, out of the water. Okay? But I interrupted you, Lisa, I no, apologize. No, it's no problem. Um, so just to let everybody know, I did put the link to that article that James mentioned in um, Vanity Fair in the chat, um, the one by um, Earl Spencer. So you can um, scroll through the chat and uh, find the link. Um, if you can't navigate chat, you can always email me and I'll send you the link um, to the Vanity Fair article by Earl Spencer. Um, so we're going to um, have these kind of um, speakers uh, throughout the rest of the school year, every month on the third Saturday. We welcome you to join us again um, for what our speakers that are coming up. We're gonna discuss the AGM next uh, month. And then um, after that, we're going to have, uh, uh, let's see, we're going to have Susan Allen Ford and, um, oh, Jerry escaped me right now. But we'll send you out an email with, um, with who's going to be on. So let's, um, we can take our mute off and clap in real time with real sound uh, for Jim. Yay. Yay. Yeah, thank you. Oh. By the you will love that article by Earl Spencer. He talks about the Kennedys. He talks about, oh, it, it, it's a wonderful article filled with numerous uh, e examples. I think you'll get a, get a treat at it. Hi, Jeannie. Hi, Jim. This is the <laughs> second time I've heard your talk. I liked it so well the first time. Oh, good. <laughs> so, yes, we're, we're, Jim is a very popular speaker. We've always wanted to have him on the East Coast. Unfortunately, he lives on the West Coast. This is giving us a chance to hear him. Yep. Um, inheritance is such a great, um, fascinating topic. So we really appreciate it. Um, thank you so much, Jim James, for talking with us. Um, and uh, we hope that we'll see all of you at some of our upcoming um, presentations. Have a great afternoon. Huzzah! Huzzah! <laughs> Bye-bye now. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Uh, thank you. Bye-bye. Lisa? Yes. You said that link was in the chat? Yes, it is. 
I can't find it. I've gone through the whole chat. It's way up toward the beginning. I went all the way to the top. Yeah, me too. It's 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 towards the beginning. Um, yeah. It's, is that it's, uh, uh, is that Ellen? Yeah, yeah it's Ellen. Ellen. Yeah, I yeah, see can, it. We can email it to you if you can't find it. Yeah. Okay, I was gonna say, could you email it or put it on the blog? Yeah, we will. Uh, we'll email it to you. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. So, right. Maureen, Maureen, can you find the the link? And no, it's not on mine either. And I, I'm at the very top of it. Um, it's at 1:52 p.m. Oh, see, there's times in the chat that it's 1:52 p.m. Look at the bottom. I just put it at the bottom. Okay. Oh, great. Thanks. That work. Oh, that's excellent. Yes, that was the smart thing. Put it at the bottom. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye. 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 All right. So. Bye, everyone. Yes. Um, all right. So I think that um, we're. Oh, look, there's more people. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm leaving. Okay. Bye. 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 It doesn't look like any other. It was. Uh... Chris. Thank you, Celia, for running it. You're welcome. Yes. Thank you. It was wonderful. Bye-bye, Ellen. Bye. So we can't kill can we? I can. Oh. Thank you. So Thank if, you everybody, if everybody's ready to go, I can just end the whole meeting. Okay. Okay, yeah, thanks. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.